Thanks for joining us today. Hey, I don't know about you guys, but I love the Applebee's show. A great story. I was enthralled. almost forgot I was supposed to go on air. Well, today we're talking with those who know something you may not about hurting children through childhood. What I'm really talking about is overscheduling. Now, again, I'm host Kim Power Stilson, and this is a talk-worthy radio show. So let's talk about this. Um, there was recently a post on uh, a blog on the Huffington Post, and our guest today is Dr. Gail Gross, and she's going to be talking with us about her post. It had thousands and thousands of people respond to it because the subject was overscheduling our children. Now, Today we're, we're going to talk about hurrying our children through childhood. And just to start us off, I want to talk about what my mom's childhood was like compared to mine and compared to my kids today. So my mom grew up in Minnesota, and after having uh, immigrated from Scandinavia with her family, um, but she was born in Minnesota, and they took care of the cows. They came home from school and uh, milked cows and prepared for dinner and worked in the farm fields when necessary, um, peeled potatoes. Their after school was spent at home, in the kitchen usually, or out in the fields with their family. Now, let's fast forward 20-something odd years, and my after school, um, living in suburbia in the middle of California, we... Uh, Occasionally had after school sports. Um, I was a, a cheerleader in high school and, and we had practice a couple nights a week, um, in the mornings all summer. But most of our time we spent bike riding around the neighborhood, visiting the mall, um, and occasionally I had to make, I had to make dinner for my kids. I was the oldest of six kids. So, you know, a lot of family centered activities and then as well, um, as well, uh, the opportunity to spend time on my own. Now, fast forward another 25 some odd years. Years, and it's my kids. And every night after school until for the last couple of years, they spent in some sort of lesson or another, um, doing homework, doing uh, advanced, uh, taking college courses their last few years of high school, and um, between basketball classes and college courses and service projects, they had almost no time. So it would be 9 o'clock at night before my kids had a chance to even just relax. So there was no running around the streets till the twilight hours. There was no peeling potatoes with mom in the kitchen. It was all about their activities. And a couple of years ago, I stopped that and had them choose only a few things so they were available at least two nights a week and um, that has made a huge difference in our home and as well we've had a chance to eat dinner together and I've taught them to peel potatoes. Now I don't know about you if you're listening to me but you know I, I, I have some kids that don't know I know some neighbor kids that don't know how to peel potatoes so I don't know if that's even necessary today if you have to peel potatoes but I thought that was one of the funnest things I did with my mom and she did with her mom back on the farm. So we're going to go with that to um, the I, the um, theme for the talk radio show today, which is uh, hurrying kids through childhood, and we're going to talk with an expert. She is um, an education expert and human behavioral expert. She blogs for the Huffington Post, and her bio just goes on and on. We have Dr. Gail Gross with us, and she is the one who uh, was on the Huffington Post talking about this that had all of these um, incredible responses to it. Now, uh, aside from being an author and educator, Dr. Gail Gross is, uh, has an, a positive integrative approach to dealing with difficult issues that help, um, that families today in the nation are facing. She's called upon by national and regional media to offer inside and topic, topics anywhere from family relationships to development issues. She's been on CNN, Fox's The O'Reilly Factor, MSNBC, The New York Times, USA Today, ABC, CBS, and you name it. So also she is a veteran talk radio show host, which will be fun for us here on the PBS program called Let's Talk. Dr. Gross, welcome. Oh, thank you, Kimberly. Good to talk to you. Well, I'm glad you joined us today, and thank you. Your your recent post, um, your recent blog post on the Huffington Post was quite the um, yeah. So tell us about that. That's uh, that. I was shocked to read all that. I thought it was very uh, eye opening. Well, you know, it, this is I. I have two PhDs. My first was education curriculum and instruction. My second was psychology, and so I've been looking at this problem for oh, since the '90s, the early '90s, and I've watched this effect just grow and grow and grow. Where children are really hurried into adulthood, you, you can see it in the clothes we put on children, the dolls that they play with, the, the Barbie dolls that are, have extreme sexual uh, parts to them and clothes to them and, and the books that we read them now and the, the, even the shows that we 
um, have created for children are really have very, very adult underpinnings. And it's really this hurrying children through childhood, and it's having a terrible impact on our children because the children are developing the same problems that adults who are stressed have, like ulcers and regressive behavior like nail biting and pulling out hair and not being able to sleep well at night and stomach problems and just stress problems. And so we have to step back and say, what are we doing creating little adults out of our our little children? Now, you know, you say terrible problems. So I'm going to ask, uh, maybe I saw this on your blog, maybe I'm cheating and I don't realize it. <laughs> you know, it, how do we weigh that? Because, you know, we they're, we want them to succeed, so we want them to know the things we didn't know, right? And on the other hand, you know, we don't want them to have know all that we know either because obviously I, I have a child that has a thyroid problem that shouldn't at 19 but does. And the doctor said he's seeing it in younger and younger kids because of the stress. Um, right. So how do you, like, how do you, what is so terrible? What, besides the health issues, what's so terrible on one side? And then on the other, you know, tell us about why people are, you think people are doing this. Well, just simple things like creative play. You know, when we were children, when I was a child, I had time by myself. In fact, children don't even want to play with other children until they're three years old. They play side by side, but not together. If you ever look at them in a nursery, you'll see that. And the reason is because children are developing their own sense of imagination and creativity, and these are the things that we want them to develop because these are the things that will create in the end these wonderful ideas that give us antibiotics and and cancer cures and take us to the moon. It's creative thinking, and that comes out of our childhood brain development. And if we stress that childhood brain, then it doesn't develop to its full potential. And mainly, these things are creative creative. So we have to let that childhood brain develop creatively and children need just quiet play. That means not play that's geared towards anything educational. Not play to teach something. Simply play for play's sake. Just letting a child use its own imagination, be on the floor. You know, somehow in the 90s we got this idea that being a parent meant that you have to 24-7 interact with your child or you have to go to work and not interact with your child. And both ideas are out of balance. But the middle way is that we need to let our children know we're there for them so that they're, they're, we're their touchstone so they feel secure and let them explore in a safe environment that we've created for them so that they can find their gifts, so they can find their own center, and that they can develop their own potential. Well, I love what you're saying. It reminds me of this quote by Bill Cosby, the comedian. He said, the essence of childhood, of course, is play, which my friends and I did endlessly on streets that we reluctantly shared with traffic. <laughs> and I love that quote. It's true. Yeah, because it's wonderful. So I'm going to tell you and listeners a little story and then maybe tell me. So, so the, I, because I want to relate this to you and I want your opinion on it, so I'm being a little selfish, but I have, um, I lived in the, the mountains and it was, we lived on, in a home that was surrounded by trees, had more bears and cougars than people. And I raised my kids there and so I was always, instead of enjoying this mountain retreat, I was always driving them to their events. And then when I made this decision to have my kids at home more, because before I knew it, they were so big and old, and I missed them. And, um, you know, I worried about this overscheduling. So I we went ahead and moved to a city. And we moved to the city, and I found myself and my children, at first when we got there, we were kind of in a culture shock. So when we had less scheduled, we didn't really know what to do with ourselves. So I'd say to my daughter, well, why don't you read a book? And she'd say, I don't have time, Mom. So... So we would sit by this on this window seat, and we would read a book, but we kept looking out of our window because we kept seeing people. Now, in the mountains, we didn't see people walk by our home, but here people were walking to take out the rubbish, or they were on skateboards or on bikes, and all of a sudden we saw all these people. And we all kind of stayed inside the house because we didn't really know, you know, this is kind of a shock to my kids who've been raised away from people. And my 13-year-old son, he got out and started playing. They started playing night games, which is like they play hide-and-go-seek in the dark. I don't think it's safe, and I wouldn't 
recommend it. But anyway, they were starting to play games. And then my son all of a sudden spends all of his time outside. He hardly touches the Wii or the PlayStation. And he's integrated himself into this run through the cherry orchard, you know, play with your friends outside, take the dog a walk kind of mentality. Well, my older girls are still like, ah, uh, I don't really know what to do, <laughs> you know, because they don't, they're not used to having their time scheduled. So I kind of ruined, I don't know, is it too late? And did I ruin their kind of, you know, chance to learn how to have a childhood time of, of you know, being brave enough to venture out? Well, I, you know, I really, what I think you did was wonderful. And at the end of the day, you know, children, the most important thing we can give our children is bonding, simply bonding. If you bond well with your child, your child will do better at everything. It'll stick to their problems, their problem solving better. It'll, uh, it will strike out into unknown areas better. It will, uh, deal with bullying better. It will deal with all of life's problems better because a well-bonded child has good self-esteem. They feel secure. And so, you know, even juvenile delinquents, when asked, what do you want? What is the one single thing that you want? They, they almost to a person said they would have liked to have more time with their parents. Wow. The parents keep putting children into activities mainly because they feel guilty. They're working and they feel, well, I'll put my child in dance or gymnastics or music or painting or ballet or whatever. And as a result, their child is structured in all these other activities, but they're not having time with mom and dad. And what children really need besides quiet time to be creative is time with mom and dad. Now, sadly, we as a culture have to work. Is that the best of all possible worlds for our children? No. The best of all possible worlds in the imaginary world that we used to have is for mom and dad, you know, for mom to be home with children. Now, they can't because... We have to work, so they have to compensate. We have to figure out a way to make up to our children that we are separating from them way too early. They have to go through attachment issues, uh, way, detachment issues way too early, and so we have to compensate by giving them time when we are free, weekend time, dinner time. You know, families that sit down to a dinner, back to your original story with the potatoes, if you sit down to dinner with your children, which I thought was so smart of you, Kimberly, that actually raises children's outcome in school. Their, their performance is better in school when they have family time, just simply sitting down to one meal a day with their family as a family. So we know that bonding is central to our children, and it's central to how they learn and how they think and how they process information because it says that they're secure and they have good self-esteem and they have that good central core, that core that helps them cope with peer group socialization, bullying, and all of the other things that they have to deal with in school. You know, suicide doesn't always come from bullying and things that we hear about. Many times kids commit suicide because they feel too much pressure to perform, too much pressure in school. In fact, Japan has the highest level of suicide for teenagers because these kids are so pressure to perform at such a high level when they get into the adolescent period. So, you know, as, as a, a culture, we need to get back to recognizing how important the family really is, how important mom really is. You know, a little child doesn't even see their mom as separate. They see their mom as an appendage. That's my mom, which is why divorce is so hard on children, because they can't even comprehend the idea that these two people who are appendages, a part of them, are going to not be together and not be with them. Yeah, we are on the Talk Worthy Radio Show talking with Dr. Gail Gross, who is a nationally recognized family and child development expert, author, and educator. We'll be right back with more after this brief break. Welcome back to the Talk Worthy Radio Show. I'm your host, Kim Power Stilson, and today we're talking with those who know something you may not about hurrying children through childhood. We have Dr. Gail Gross with us. She's a human behavior and education expert and a blogger for the Huffington Post who recently 
uh, made a post that had a lot of people talking, and it was about this overscheduling and hurrying our children through high school. Dr. Gail Gross, welcome back. Before the break, we were talking about, I wanted to ask about this. We were talking about um, issues and cultural issues, and you mentioned Japan um, and the suicide rate being higher there or prevalent there because of this um, crowding. And I, I spent two years of my life in Japan, and I actually taught English. I was an English tutor to Japanese students. And that was just something that I really did notice there, and maybe you could further comment on that, is that those kids went from class to class to course, and their parents, we'd be doing English lessons, and if it was a little fun or engaging, my teaching, the parents got upset with me. Right. And and they okay. didn't want their kids to have fun. And these kids were like seven. They were little. Yeah, yeah. You are so wise, and you're really so experienced. You know, in our culture, we raise our children in the beginning with discipline and structure. And when they become adolescents, we lighten up. In Japan, it's in reverse. They are highly, they highly pressure their adolescents, and they're lighter with their, their little children. And parents often accompany their, their, um, elementary school children to school. And, you know, you, you know about the whole thing about saving face and that the yes. children's Point outcome re- reflects completely on the parent. So if the parent is shamed that the child isn't performing well and the child gets the message that love is based on performance, that they better perform, and that their future is, of course, on, if they get into a college track or not because if it's vocation and not college they don't get a good job and the, you know the company acts as the family and so forth. So what we notice in Japan is that when these children become adolescents they have a higher rate of suicide than other countries and the reason is because they are under too much pressure to perform and that they feel that there are all these reasons that if they don't perform well that that go back to their parents. They, their parents are shamed. Their parents lose faith. So they are, it's a heavy burden that they carry, that their performance reflects that their parents speak their, as parents, their parents' performance as parents. As a result, um, you see this, and not just in adults, but you see it in children, and much more than in our own country. We see a lot of suicide, however, in our country with bullying, and we're starting to see it more from children feeling too much pressure. You know, Finland has a great school model, and they're... Their, and their teachers are very connected to the children, but their teachers also have master's degrees, and they're taken from the top tier of graduating classes from their university. So um, teaching is respected as it is in Japan, but the attitude is different where the child, it's much more child-centered. And these kids are, are performing beautifully in Finland, for example, and, and we see these problems now in Japan. And in, in Germany as well. Well, I, I was so going to add this whole idea of super kids that came out of the 60s and the 70s and the 80s. And, uh, you know, kids, I, I, I was on a bus, was on a trip with my husband, and we got a phone call from my daughter-in-law, and she said that our grandchild got into a particular school, and everybody said, oh, was that college? And I said, no, nursery school. Because now children are registered at birth to get into a nursery school. I mean, consider what we are doing as a a culture to our children. You know, I I think that's interesting. And and we're talking about, again, for our audience, we're talking about hurrying our children through childhood and the pressure we're putting on them. And now, Dr. Gross, we... uh, Taylor's here with us in the studio, uh, the producer of the show, and she was asking, you know, what do you have to say for the argument that parents are scheduling their kids to keep them out of the, out of trouble, keep them away from drugs or, or gangs? Um, you know, and again, we're talking about our cults, back to our culture. We were talking about Finland and Japan. Um, with this American culture and putting our kids in nursery school early, that's one issue. But what about keeping them busy when they're older and, you know, maybe the parents are working? Well, you know, my mom was not a working parent, but she did believe in keeping us busy, and we had, you know, things that we did. So there was this feeling that we went from thing to thing, but that we were doing those things with with our parents around. Today, children are sent to these things many times 
because their parents aren't home and they want to keep them busy or because they're trying to compensate for feeling guilty that they're not home working and so forth and trying to, as you said earlier, opening the show, trying to give them what they didn't, what they didn't have. But at, we have to compensate. Everything is balanced. So if we are doing this, then we also have to compensate by giving them mom time, dad time, so they, and, and, pro, and time down so that we release the pressure. If you just keep building pressure and give no outlet for releasing that pressure, if everything is an educational game, every toy is an educational toy, every event is an activity that mom and dad structured, then there's no me time. There's no downtime. You think of you as an adult. You're working all week. I'm sure all you, you want to do is get home, kick off your shoes, and just have some you time, whether it's a hot bath, whether it's reading a book, whether it's watching your favorite movie. Well, kids are really developing. Their brain is developing. They don't have coping skills the way we do, and so we have to give them free time to do the same, free time to play, to imagine, to find their gifts, to find what they're interested in. If everything is structured, if every activity is educational, they don't have that. You know, we, we find kids in kindergarten fearing that they're going to fail because we, we put so much pressure on their performance on this idea of super kids, learning languages before they're three years old. And, and, you know, the brain has to develop on its own. It has to unfold like a little flower. And if we keep pressuring it, it changes the way it develops from just the stress of pressuring it. So it can't unfold in a natural way. It's going to react to stress so that the way it processes information will change, the way that you think will change, and the, and the way that you deal with problem solving will change because you, you, the anxiety we build up in children will show itself as they become adolescents and start critically thinking. And that's when they fail, they underachieve. That's when they feel that they can't take a good test, they feel anxious. They don't know why they're feeling anxious. They have this free-floating anxiety. But it's all related to their inability to focus and concentrate, which goes back to early stressors that we give them when the brain is developing. You know, so in a sense, the stress is changing the architecture of the brain. You know, I, I was going to say, I don't think I've ever heard that so beautifully described before. I mean, oh, thank you. It just well done. It just clicked with me because I think, and I and I don't know if you if you if you can or want to do this, but you know, let's say you take a look at Japan, and I know Japan Japanese children children before a certain age are crazy. Like the mom, the mom's given sugar, and they run around, right. you know, and then all of a sudden they're they're for, for put into the school. And you were talking about Finland with this wonderful kind of balance, and so. As I'm hearing you, I, I hear you saying that there needs to be a balance of bonding with parents. Right. So how do you how do you compete in today's world where there some parents are still haven't heard from you, right? And don't don't haven't just heard this beautiful articulation which told me, okay, it's okay to let my kids sit in a room and figure out what to do, um, or and, I, and then when they were little. To how do you how do you compete then with parents who do have their kids you know learning languages playing the piano reading at a the twelfth grade level when they're five? Well, you know it's so interesting. The brain is so interesting, and that's the new frontier really neuroscience. And when we think of how the brain develops and how children's brains develop, for example, Head Start. Head Start works because it, it, it's teaching children that are at, that have deficits that need to be brought up to average that, to give them an, a level playing field. But if your child is at that level playing field and doesn't have social deficits, then Head Start won't make any difference, for example. So it's the same with all the things that we're teaching children very early teaching them to read at very, very early, teaching them math very, very early. Actually, in the long run, that really won't make any difference. The only place it makes a difference is language. When we teach language very, very early, not by rote, but by listening, then children have the ability to track 
by the by hearing a language and hearing a meter and the rhythm of the way the language sounds. So children that learn languages normally just from conversation early on don't have accents later on. And it usually cuts off at about 10 to 12. But that's because the brain is tracking that language by the meter, by the rhythm, by the sound, and it's picking it up in a natural way. Actually, however, the brain gets its best chance at learning in general by allowing it to unfold, by allowing it to progress it's using its own potential. You want to have a, a print-rich environment, but you want your child to explore that environment. You want to read to your child. That will help them become a better reader, but you don't want to force them by teaching them in an unnatural way. A good way to teach your child to read, which is a, a balance and a compensation, is to read to them and read something over and over to, to them that they know and that they'll ultimately start picking up sight words and ultimately they'll memorize those words and they'll read the story back to you and ultimately they learn to read. That's a natural way that the brain reads rather than to put flashcards up everywhere and pressure your child. The key word is balance. To do things in a natural way, that allows the brain to develop without stress. But to stress the brain is to change the way this, the brain develops. And by changing the way the brain develops, we're changing forevermore the way your child will learn. So we're literally, we put too much cortisol into the body, which is a stress hormone. The cortisol changes the architecture of the brain. I don't want to get too complicated, but just simply to tell you, the hippocampus, which is the part of the brain where learning is and where memory lives, gets narrower when we stress children. And if we stress them consistently, it will dump neurons and get narrower forevermore. So, so Dr. Gross, again, is a national recognized, nationally recognized family and child development expert, author, and educator, and recently posted on the Huffington Post. We're going to talk with her more about hurting our children through childhood after this brief break. And welcome back to the Top Worthy Radio Show. I'm your host, Kim Power Stilson. Thanks so much for joining us. You can find out more about our show and the guests that we have coming on on the TalkWorthyRadio.com website. You can find us on Facebook at TalkWorthy.com, and you can find my website at KimPowerStilson.com. Today we're talking with those who know something you may not about hurrying your kids through uh, school and um, maybe over scheduling. We have Dr. Gail Gross with us, and Dr. Gross received her second PhD in psychology. She's also the recipient of, of Kappa Delta Pi, an international honor society in education. We are very lucky to have her on the show with us. Uh, Dr. Gross, thank you for joining us. Thanks, Kimberly. It's a pleasure. Well, we're we're excited to have you on. And during the break, you know, with radio, since you're a talk show host, you you know this. During the break, <laughs> the best questions come up, right? Always. So we uh, during the break, I was talking with Taylor, and she's again the producer of the show, and she's about to start her childbearing year. She's just recently married. Versus me, you know, I've my kids are now I'm all teenagers, <laughs> and I've I've done over scheduling, and I've tried to compensate. And between the two of us, we had a couple questions for you. Do you mind? Not at all. Okay, Taylor. Okay, so I guess my question is, um, you talk a lot about pressure on kids for schoolwork, and but then you also talked about activities and overscheduling. Um, what what is maybe wrong or like with activities maybe that are more for the kids that are what they are maybe interested in, like basketball or things like that? Is how does that affect crafts or? You know, everything is in balance. One of the reasons children need free time to explore and to find their gifts is to find out what they're interested in. You know, they may be interested in crafts. They may be interested in painting. Then, when you take them to lessons, it's something that sparks their passion. So it's not just that they're going to another activity. This activity has meaning to them, and it it sparks their imagination and their passion and has something to do with their interests. Say it's the clarinet. Your child loves playing the clarinet. Then taking your child to clarinet lessons feeds his gift, feeds his passion. But we have to give children the place and the time to find their passion. 
And if we give them free time, free play, creative play, that will come out of them. And if we don't force them to stick with anything, I always tell, I always tell parents, rent these instruments. Let your child try them out so that they're not going to have to, that old adage, you know, if you're going to buy it, you're going to play it, whether you want to or not, and we're not going to let you quit. That's the wrong approach. Renting it, renting, renting it for just a couple of weeks so that your child can test it out, see if they like it, see if they're interested. These are the ways we help children find their gifts. If they want to write or, you know, one of the things we know is that there are certain things, especially for you, Taylor, starting out with just childbearing years, when you have your little baby, you may not know this, but while you're carrying your baby, your baby is learning. The foundations for language are being established in utero. Ten weeks before delivery, your baby is hearing your voice, the meter and the rhythm of your voice, and is and you're actually laying down the foundation for their learning language after birth. So also your child feels your stress. Cortisol crosses the placenta, and if you're stressed, you'll change your baby's brain development in the womb. And a lot of babies that have very low tolerance for stress were overstimulated by stress in the womb. So, you know, we're learning a lot about how our brains develop and how our children develop. One thing that's happening in our culture is we sort of step back. We've become very technologically advanced, but we're still very emotionally immature. We're not too different than our Ice, ice Age caveman because we're still operating off of flight and fight. And so in our society, parents have all these options now given to them. They want to go out. They want to do this. They want to do that. And they want to have children. <laughs> so... They want it all. And at the end of the day, if you're going to have children, you can't have it all. You have to give a compensation for having to work for your children at home. You have to bond and be there. That old adage, it's quality time, not quantity, is a big lie. It's more quantity than quality because moms and dads don't have to play with their children, but they have to be around. If you're in the space where your children can call for you if they need you, then they feel secure. Then they have a sense of stability, and that's how they're building their central core. So... You know, if I tell you, Taylor, that if you speak to your baby in complicated language rather than goo goo gaga language, that your baby will be building more of an associative mass and will actually use more of their brain and learn to read more quickly, learn to speak better, in a sense you're broadening their IQ, you would speak to them in complicated language rather than short demands and commands. But if you don't have that knowledge, you don't know that. Well, if you're not around, you can't do that. If a nursery school is raising your child or a nanny is raising your child, they may not be speaking to your child in complicated language. So everything is a compensation. If you have to work and be away, you have to compensate by giving them a lot of you when you're home. You can't, you know, children, we've been able to measure children's anxiety in relation to going into nursery school early and, and detaching from mom and dad too early. Also, mom and dad going out too much at night. And children feel anxious and frightened, and they don't really know because they sort of live in the concrete. They don't think in terms of of abstraction. So they think real time, mommy's leaving, is she going to come back? They feel abandoned and frightened. So there are ways that you can leave that make things better for your child. But more importantly is to not leave too often and not put them through that too often so that you're building their security. And, you know, parents want to go out. There's a lot of fun things to do out there. So this generation has parents that actually are looking at things in a, in a skewed way. We have a lot to offer our children intellectually, but we're not really making our children more emotionally secure. In fact, your child may act grown up, but really feel like a child. They may be speaking grown up, that really they're feeling like a child. So we have to look at our children and realize that no matter how sophisticated they seem, 
they are children and they need to be treated with as children with mom and dad around as much as possible and to offer them consciously that compensation. You know, I think that's wonderful advice, all coming back to, to balance, right? So, right. So whatever age, right, Taylor, you're, uh, you'll be a, a new mom within, in the next 10 years. We're not announcing anything. Or <laughs> um, no I will congratulations be, yet. Yeah, not, no congratulations yet. Um, I will be a grandma again, no, not announce anything and not hurry anything eventually. Um, with, you know, you, you make mistakes and that's, that's, I look back and I have some regrets, but when you're talking, I all of a sudden feel better about myself because, you know, like I said earlier in the show, my mom, we had, I was oldest six kids. I babysat. I helped with dinner, peeled potatoes. I didn't, you know, if I could get out of the house and ride my bike to my friend's house and we can all, you know, make prank calls on the phone, that was kind of our, you know, fun thing to do. With my kids, they, they haven't had as much time to do that, but I'm, I'm remedying it. And so what you're saying is that even if we've, if our kids maybe have some of these anxiety caused um, illnesses because we've had them overscheduled, it's not too late, right? We can start now and spending a little more quality time with them and letting them, and I guess, and I'm talking a lot, but I, I wanted to get through this. There was, um, do you remember that tsunami we had, that terrible one the day on Boxing Day after Christmas? Oh, yes. And you know how the, it's, I, I didn't realize it then, but it really scared my son. He was about six. It really scared him. And so he got into this box um, in our house and put his head through like he was a TV announcer. And uh-huh. he started, arti- my kids are very articulate. And he started articulating back the newscast, which talked about thousands washing ashore. And mm-hmm. and he was without any tone. And I, it worried me. And I had a friend say, just let him do it. Just let him do it. And sit there and watch it. Don't react. Don't get upset. Just let him do it. And he did that for, like, two days straight, and then he stopped, and he was fine. Mm-hmm. I'll tell you something fascinating about what you just said, Kimberly. You know, when when the psyche is feeling anxious or stressed, it often will dream something that's a container, some way of ordering uh, stability in the psyche. And so putting his head in that box, in a sense, put his head in that container. And that's very, it's really a fascinating uh, analogy because he was looking for stability and then giving you the news sort of gave him voice to what he was afraid of and gave him the, the ability to articulate, you know, sort of like talk therapy, what it was that was on his mind. That, that was really quite amazing, actually. But, you know, in everyone's life, Kim and Taylor, from birth to death, there are only two people, mother and father, and every relationship forevermore, whether it's husband, whether it's friend, whether it's relative, whatever it is, every single relationship is based on those early patterns with those two people, mother and father, and they, they are so incredibly important to the development of who we are and how we are in the world. Well, and that's that's family. That's right back to family, and um, family. I'm a big believer in that. So we need to take a break, but we are talking with Dr. Gail Gross, and she is uh, has a soon-to-be second book coming out called Smart for Life. So we're going to talk about that and more about overscheduling our children when we come back on the Talk Worthy Radio Show. So welcome back to the Talk Worthy Radio Show right here on Sirius XM 143 BYU Radio. My name is Kim Power Stilton, and you can find out more about this show on Talk Worthy radio.com and kimpowerstilton.com. Today we're talking with Dr. Gail Gross about uh, hurrying our kids through through school and through education and through childhood. And also I wanted to mention that Dr. Gail Gross is recently the recipient of the Good Heart Humanitarian Award from the Jewish Women International, and she's also won a Trailblazer Award and Woman of Influence Award. So obviously you know what you're talking about. <laughs> well, I don't know about that, but thank you. Well, I sure um, love you. I mean, from what oh, you said, thank you, you, Kimberly. You validated me, and um, so, you know, I'd like to get <laughs> a little you personal with you, Mom. From your stories, I'm telling you, you, you did. You really focused on your children. That's wonderful. 
Well, you know, thank you. I always felt, though, until today and this show, that I did not give them enough activities. Oh, my. And so I feel <laughs> great. Gave them, uh, no. gave them some of you, and that's what they needed. Well, and even with the clarinet, I did, I, my son, just we just rented a clarinet, and he asked for it, and we said, okay, we've taken your sisters through everything, including buying a grand piano, which wasn't inexpensive, <laughs> that never oh rarely my. got played. <laughs> um, but we rented the, the clarinet, and last night he asked me Good for job. the music stand and wanted to practice, and I was like, if you want to, go ahead. <laughs> Good job. So you know, I'm working. My book, the book that I'm working on, Smart, that actually is finished, Smart for Life, it talks about the developmental change stages of childhood, and if parents can understand those cha- those stages, how they can influence those stages. And, you know, boys and girls are quite different. They're wired differently, they learn differently, and they have different interests. Many times they approach the same interest in a different way. So it's very interesting about your son with the clarinet, because um, that's wonderful the way you that you did all the right things, letting him rent it, good job, <laughs> and then ask for the next thing, good job, and let him find his way with well, your support. You're the home team. I always tell parents, you're the home team. That's, that's how you can see yourself, the support there for your child. So will you tell us a little bit about you and the way you were raised? Because obviously you figured this out more rapidly than any of us. <laughs> you know, I was, um, my mother was an orphan. And so she, but her mother, my mother is 100. So her mother died in the great influenza outbreak of 1918, and her father died in uh, from typhoid a few years later. So by the time she was nine, she was an orphan. And she, therefore, didn't believe in a lot of toys and things like that. She thought they were fragile and didn't last well and weren't worth what you paid for them. But she let us play with things and write and read. We were reading, you know, uh, the encyclopedia when we were very little, and we were playing with clay, and we were painting, drawing. And she was a stay-at-home mom, and so we did a lot of this at the kitchen table with her cooking and walking around, and I went to a very small school, therefore we got to try out a lot of different um, parts, so every child felt like they were capable and and that they were competent because they got to try out all of these different things. They weren't anonymous in schools of 5,000. And, in fact, Stanley Cohn went to my high school, and he was a Nobel recipient for DNA. So, you know, we were a, we were a small school, and I came from a very small town, for example, in New Jersey. But we were a, a, a community that all knew each other and supported each other. And I think it's there that I got my idea for this home team idea. But I also recognize and I've done a lot of research in the differences between men and women and the differences in the way men and women are or children, boys and girls learn. And life is about relationships and the way boys and girls come towards a relationship. Schools, for example, are set up for girls and boys really are much too active to sit eight hours a day with an hour off for lunch, but they do. They learn to do that. And girls make eye contact. Boys don't like to make eye contact. It's back to a more primitive time when eye contact felt like a challenge. Boys pick up just one facial social cue where girls pick up six. A little girl will go to a little girl's house and say, I'll give you my best doll. I want you to be my friend. They're all about relationships. And boys really want to know if they can compete with the other little boy, if they'll get noticed for their good behavior and get a star, and if their toys are better than the other child. So we boys grow up to be more involved in problem solving. They become more involved in competition, and they'll extremely they'll, they'll expand their range of, of stress to the extreme if it'll accomplish their goal. If their boss wants something done, they'll work through the night to get it done. 
And women will do that for different reasons. Women self-sacrifice to caretake. They'll take care of their children to the death, their husband to the death. And going back to a more primitive part in our, of our development, w- women actually depended on relationships for survival. So they nurture and reach out and do a lot more talking. Men, when they're stressed, they'll go to a club or play tennis or, or do something to distract themselves or compartmentalize. Women call their girlfriend or, or their mate or somebody and talk it over. So we are wired differently, but together we do very, very well because we compensate for each other's strengths and weaknesses. You know, I I hope everyone was listening to that. That just cleared up. I, you, um, Dr. Gross, you had our engineer, who's male, nodding his head, saying, "That's it. <laughs> we, we've cleared up a I lot bet, here today." I, I bet. I bet the engineer, when his wife says, when he says to his wife on the on the sixth day, "Are you mad at me?" and she said says back, I haven't looked at you for six days, and now you're asking if I'm mad. He just didn't pick up those facial cues because men just don't pick up those facial cues. And they don't, when the mother says to her child, look at me when I talk to you, where the teacher says, look at me, and the little boy is listening, but he's looking down. It comes, it's really related to a more primitive time when it was a challenge to look at male to male in the eye. That was a... Um, a physical challenge. So we're quite different. Our hormones operate in a different way. You know, when we're stressed, we all produce cortisol and epinephrine, which lowers our immunity, raises our blood pressure, but also oxytocin, which softens that reaction. However, men produce less oxytocin, so there's less softening. And so the reactions are much different. So we're quite different, really. Men you know, I, I became quite ill seven years ago for a short period of time, and my husband was devastated, much more than I, because he wanted to solve the problem. He wanted to figure out how to get me well, and that's how husbands are, that that problem-solving, wanting to, something out of their control sets, sets them into a tizzy, where women reach out more, and we talk to other women and we talk about our feelings and we emote but men really don't do that men distract and don't want to face or look into things like that so we're quite different well, but we know, do well together <laughs> do you have a book i know you're smart for life is about teaching parents how to enhance a child's learning potential through the different developmental stages do you have a book about uh, the men and women roles i, I think oh yes happen. in fact i finished a book which is um, in the editing stage right now called The Only Way Out is Through. And it's really about the different um, passages that we go through, the, the different stages that we go through in life and how we, as men and women, and how we can navigate them successfully, how we can, knowing that we are different, how we can help ourselves and help each other. For example, menopause. I mean, women lose their estrogen and enter menopause. Well, what is estrogen? It's our tenderizer. It's what softens us. It's what makes us be willing to sacrifice for our children and our mates and be those caretakers and give up a career perhaps or whatever and and take care of our family. Men, on the other hand, have testosterone. That makes them more aggressive and assertive and and be that problem solving, that protector and get out into the world. Well, at midlife, men start losing their testosterone and they soften. Women start losing their estrogen and they tenderize. And it, in a sense, gives us a chance to come more closer together and be more mutual and be more honest in the way we communicate with each other and be more of who we were really meant to be before we took on these roles that our hormones gave us. What a wonderful world. <laughs> <laughs> really? It's, more, it's a mystery and a great gift. And, the, and life as it really is, is more fantastical than any fantasy you can come up with. It's just our, the way we can reflect on our relationships and the way we can relate to each other and the way we can become mutual at midlife, for example, are 
give it, give us a, a second lease on life. I went to a wedding. And it was a midlife wedding, and they read the Robert Browning, you know, uh. the, the best of life is yet to be. And actually, that can be true. Now, have we? Do we go through a lot of diminishing things? Do we lose our hair? Do we wrinkle? Do we maybe have constipation and incontinence? There are things such as this, but we can also compensate for those things. There are, are medicines and diet and lifestyle that compensate. You know, we now know about telomeres, which are our aging rings that fall off when we are stressed and we are aging that can be put back through lifestyle changes through stress reduction meditation healthy diet estrogen replacement or not testosterone replacement or not so the one thing that happens as we hit midlife is we know who we are we are more of who we are and therefore we can communicate more authentically with one another sexually and emotionally and in relationship and so the best can be that last third of life if we just take it we step into it with knowledge Dr. Gail Gross, we would love to have you come back on again. We're out of our show time. We have many more questions, but you can find her uh, book, Smart for Life, and we will look for The Only Way Out is Through. Again, this is Dr. Gail Gross, and you can also find her on the Huffington Post. Thanks so much for joining us today on the Talk Worthy Radio Show. We talked about hurrying our kids, not hurrying our kids through high school and uh, college and education and through childhood. And again, we talked about